In most narrative games, it's expected that we're playing the heroes. But as players, we're also attracted to really good villains. The kind of characters you could almost agree with if it weren't for that whole wanting to destroy the world thing. Yikes. So today, Eddie's back to talk to us about how to play a villain effectively in an RPG without being a jerk at your table. This episode is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Want to watch their awesome stuff free for 30 days? Then use the invite code extra credits at the link below. While hanging out with Eddie at Gen Con last year, he, somehow, managed to turn many a conversation toward professional wrestling, which, if you know Eddie at all, happens all the time. Amongst these chats, he mentioned that the way villains are portrayed in the squared circle really helped him to understand how to play them in games, ranging from Pugmire to Vampire the Masquerade. So what did he learn? How do we create great villains when we're role-playing with our friends, particularly if you're a player rather than a game master? Well, let's start by calling back to the episode we did a bit ago on boundaries in tabletop games. If none of your players want to see a particular brand of villainy in the game, you just don't bring it. Period. You may think that your idea for a character that tortures people in interesting ways before killing them will help your character be established as appropriately vile. But if someone's uncomfortable with torture being portrayed at the table, it's best to work on the character more and find a different angle for your villain. Now, obviously, the biggest reason to do that is because you want everyone in your game to have a good time and feel safe. But there's another reason, which leads to the second point. The players have to, on some level, want to engage with this character. A well-done villain is one your players look forward to running into, even if it's just to give that dastardly do-wronger their comeuppance. If a player is portraying a villainous character, then there does need to be more explicit sympathy. Because then, the other players need a compelling reason why they'd even put up with the villain in the first place. Even if everyone is also playing a villain. Maybe it's something obvious like a shared mutual goal, or something more complicated like characters who believe they can reform the villain. But the best villains have to have a spark of something you can relate to even if you don't agree with them. Too much sympathy, however, can push a character to anti-hero territory or even just to hero who's also kind of a jerk. This is a fine line, and one especially hard to tread if players are portraying villainous characters, because one of the big narrative techniques we use to recognize villains as villains is that usually they're not our point-of-view characters. At the end of the day, no matter how good the reasons, the villain's goals need to be generally recognized as bad. And this is the reason that villains like Thanos work so well. Although he thinks what he's doing is right, and has justified it to himself as morally sound, the protagonists of the story realize that destroying half of all life in the universe randomly is wrong. Heroes find different solutions. Which takes us nicely to Game Master villains. Because while players who portray villains inherently have certain narrative functions since they are still a protagonist, a Game Master's villain is an antagonist, and therefore has some different narrative rules, as their goals are usually more intertwined with the direction the GM wants the story to go. An effective Game Master villain always reinforces why the character is a villain. And if they do the right thing, it's for the wrong reasons. When they join forces with the good guys, it's most likely to betray them in the end. And if they think, at last, the villain might give up their nefarious ways, they encounter a temptation that's just too strong and given to the dark side again. Now, of course, your villains don't always have to do this, but if they consistently don't, they aren't really villains anymore from the perspective of the narrative. And another great narrative point that we can take from professional wrestling is no matter how entertaining a villain is, remember that their ultimate purpose in the game is to lose. And that doesn't mean that the villain needs to suddenly become an idiot and ruin all of their own plans. Some of the best villains are characters that are on the brink of achieving everything only to have one bad day against a group of determined protagonists. And when villains inevitably lose, they should lose big. Because these are characters whose fails are designed to make the heroes look good. Not to mention, nobody's ever happy when they have to compromise with a villain, particularly one that does nothing but hurt people. And that's maybe the most important point. A well-crafted villain takes actions because they think that it's beneficial to themselves or their goals, and not out of pure sadism. Sure, villains can take sadistic actions, especially if they've had a long rivalry with other characters. But sadism just for the sake of sadism is the fastest way to turn your villain into a creep. And not a very believable creep at that. After all, even the most evil people do think that they're the good guy, or at least can justify their actions to themselves. So unless you want to create some cartoonish enemy or 80s slasher film monster, the villain has to have a motivation other than just hurting people. In fact, the villain probably only cares about the heroes, because they're the people who keep getting in their way. In the end, whether you're a player or a game master, you want to make your villain a person, someone the heroes have a relationship with. And a villain in a tabletop game should be fun, both to interact with, and to despise. 
And if you hit the right balance, not only will players cheer when the villain is ultimately defeated, but they'll also ask for them to come back again to ruin more of their days. No, no, Zoe, I, I mean at the table, narratively, not in real life. See? Good. Wait, no, 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 no! Ah, so that's where the leftover eggnog went. You are lucky it's delicious, cat. Once again, thanks so much to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this episode. Their cultivated platform of documentaries and nonfiction titles spans a gamut of topics across science, nature, history, technology, society, and lifestyle. In fact, I lost myself in one particularly saucy literary look back, entitled Frankenstein and the Vampire, A Dark and Stormy Night, which recounts a fateful evening that birthed not only the modern vampire myth, but also the tale that started our extra sci-fi series, and of course science fiction proper, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Cue lightning crash! Thank you. And you can bring learning to life with unlimited access to this and other amazing stories starting at just $2.99 a month or $19.99 a year. Plus, if you head to curiositystream.com slash extra credits and use the invite code extra credits, you can even get your first 30 days free.